Bibles to John this, this evening. Let's see, it's hot up here. About a month ago, I brought a couple messages, one on Sunday morning and one on Sunday night, uh, on the I Am's of the book of John. Uh, in the morning, that talked about in John chapter 6, Christ, what he was doing in all these I Am's, very interesting. Uh, he, of course, always, I mean, many times talked in parables or earthly stories or heavenly meanings. And even though we can't call these parables, he's still using earthly examples and illustrations to help the people understand what he's talking about. In John chapter 6, he was in the area of the Sea of Galilee. And verse 2, it says, A great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. In verse 5, he says, he sees all these people, and he says this, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, verse 6, it says, He said that to prove him, for he himself knew what he was going to do, what he would do. And it talks about the 5,000 men, I count the women and children were there. He had them all sit down. When it was all done, they, of the, 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 five fish and the five loaves of bread and the two small fishes, verse 12, gathered up the fragments that remained, that nothing be lost. He was talking about the physical. They all had needs. They all got hungry on a regular basis, of course. And he, being the Son of God, being the great I Am, had a means of taking care of all of them. And yes, a miracle did indeed take place. In verse 33, it says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. In verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 33 is a transition. Well, actually, verse 30, this word of God, that ye believe on him whom he sent. And then he says in verse 32, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father give it to the true bread, for the bread of God is indeed he which cometh down from heaven, talking about himself. I was thinking about what Pastor Small said this morning, and one other time he mentioned to me that person you talked to uh, the other day about didn't believe, Jesus never claimed to be God. Boy, oh boy. Just look through the book of John. He claimed, he claimed, he claimed, he claimed, right here he's going to be claiming he is God. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. In other words, you have a physical her, uh, hunger down here. I can give you something that you'll never spiritually hunger. And it goes from the physical to the spiritual. It goes through this whole area here. Down in verse 48, he said again, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna. And, the and they're dead. Physical, feed them all you want, food. They're going to die. I can give you bread my being is, I, because I am the bread of life, if you partake of me, you'll never die, everlasting life. The second one I brought was out of uh, John chapter 9. <clears throat> my throat, my voice still comes and goes. I see another doctor sometime or in, that, in the future, whatever, of the I am's. In verse 1, this time of chapter 9, he says that he passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And, of course, the discuss, discussion goes on with his disciples. Why is he blind? Was it his parents? Was it him? They say, well, how could they say, was it him himself? He'd never been born. He was born blind. Well, because some of us, the thinking this time was if a person was born with some malady like this, blindness or whatever it might be, God knew he was going to be a great sinner, and he was blinded by God. What does Christ say to him? Neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he takes a physical situation. This man's blind. He's going to transition that over once again to spiritual blindness. Think of all the people around us right here. Mansfield, Litchfield, Hudson, Nashua, Hampstead. I mean, all the towns around us here. How many of them have ever really heard a clear presentation of the gospel? Uh, praise God, Connie on the other side of the street does know Christ as her Savior. Most of my other neighbors, as I've talked to them, and some of them have approached me, uh, I don't know how many have ever heard the gospel 
But I know this. I have responsibility. And I know this. You have responsibility to take the light of Christ and shine it on them. I'm reading a second book by uh, Steve Curry. Steve Curry is named Curry's son. He's got two or three ministries in East Jerusalem. Now, East Jerusalem's probably about 85, 90% Muslim. Uh, and that's where his church is. They have, every, he'll, first, everybody wanted to rent to him. Then they found out what he was and what he was doing. And one by one, it's in a third or four different location now in East Jerusalem where the landlord, whoever that might be, says, no, you can no longer stay. It's too dangerous for us. We talk about witnessing to people. We shouldn't be mean to them. We shouldn't argue with them or anything like that. But one thing Steve Curry says all the time, as does his father, we must be truthful. I think Pastor Small mentioned that this morning. We've got to be truthful. He said a man came to him, and he uh, was asking him questions, and he didn't realize he was a Christian. And this man was a Muslim, and Steve had known him for a little while and somehow had connections, and Steve uh, had started to witness to him and tell him there's only one way to heaven. And he didn't say it's not, he did not say it's not through Muhammad or anything like that. He said it's only, only through Jesus Christ. They don't mind Jesus Christ. Now, I've got some uh, papyrus uh, pictures in my office that I picked, bought in Egypt. And uh, there's Jesus on some of those. Jesus fleeing, going down to Egypt. There's three or four other pictures of, of, of Jesus. They have no problem with Jesus as a person or even as a prophet. But when you get it all brought down to that Jesus is the only way, then they sometimes do indeed get mad. And uh, that man, when I talked to him, he had another friend of his, another Muslim, come up and said, why did you, why did you uh, make him so mad? He said, I simply told them about Christ. I simply told them the truth. People, we can't mince words with people because the light won't really shine on them. We can't be worried about if they're going to like us or not. We have to take the light, which is the Word of God, and Christ himself, and by God's grace, shine it on people. And hopefully and prayerfully, the darkness will fade away as they see this is the truth. That same man called them back six months later. He tried to kill himself and things like that. He walks into the house. Uh, couldn't find a man. At first, it was all dark in there. Finally, he found this, this man who he'd witnessed to six months before that. He found out he'd been gotten into alcohol and stuff like that. He really wanted to kill himself. But he couldn't. It's, he said, somebody stop me from killing myself. Steve, can you help me? Can you tell me what happened? He said, all I know is this. My God is a loving God. He didn't want you to kill yourself. You've heard the word of God. The word of God has been planted. And about two hours later, that Muslim accepted Christ as Savior, and so did his aunt that was there. But it all took place because they, he took the light, wasn't ashamed of the light, wasn't fearful of what might happen, because things do happen in that part of the world. And he shined that light on Christ. Christ used this blind man to show them that, he, that all men are blind. They can't see. And that he wants to give them life everlasting. So it's, it's not just about physically being blind. The one I want to talk about tonight comes from chapter 10. I'm the shepherd. I'm the door, let's say. And that was actually mentioned. Something, somebody's either, I think Pastor Small said something about just tonight. I wrote it down and I left my notes on it, whatever. It says in verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief, and the robber. Verily, verily. <laughs> it means sit up. It means listen. It means take note. It means I'm going to say something that's very, very, very important. And I want you to understand exactly what's being said. What is a sheepfold? Well, in the Middle East, where Christ was at this time, and if you go there now, you'll still see some sheepfolds still set up. The kind that you'll see now, but I'll talk about a different kind a little bit later, uh, are made of rocks, and they just put rocks up, up to about three or four feet, and they go 15, 20 feet square, and they do have a, like a, an entrance. And that's where the sheep were brought at night, put in there, quieted down, and the shepherd would stay right near the entrance. Sometimes sleep inside, sometimes sleep outside, sometimes 
start a little fire, or whatever the case is. It's a place where the sheep are kept, a secure place of safety, a place of where the, uh, the sheep, you and, you, you and I who know the shepherd, and the shepherd knows you, is the closest place of security, salvation, eternal life, of acceptance, of well-being, of peace, of comfort, of intimacy, of heavenly joy. Now, he's talking about something physical again. You've got to calm the sheep down. You've got to bring them into this place of security. You've got to watch over, th- over them. And the shepherd would stay right there. How many times David, I wonder, stayed with the sheep at nighttime? You read the, the psalmist many, many places. He stayed with the sheep. And he's going to give them illustrations of that shepherd and how much he loved the sheep. Deliverance from darkness, growing faith. Matthew chapter, I won't go there, in Bethlehem. Uh, the small doors that they have, even to go in some of the churches, especially the one in Bethlehem. You have to bend down low to get in. Why? It's all protection. The sheepfold. We're going to come back to that later because Christ is going to come back to it a little bit later. He says in verse 2, but he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Very specific, exclusive door. In this room here, we have one, one door there, one, two, three, four doors. There are people who will tell you that all ways lead to heaven. There are people who will tell you that any door you go through, as long as you're sincere, as long as you, you really mean what you're saying, you really believe in this or you believe in that, whatever it might be, that's okay. And I've had hundreds of people probably tell me that over the years. They've said that all ways, any way to get to heaven, whatever they call it, some don't call it heaven, they call it different names, is okay. Jesus Christ is a very specific door. He's the only door that you can go through that will lead to heaven. We'll see that in a little while here. Some say that baptism saves. Sacraments saves. You want to keep all seven of them, and you're a good person. Mary saves. I have a book in my office, uh, Mary the Mother, the Queen of Heaven. I've read that two or three times in my life just to understand what, the, what some of the Catholics believe that you have to pray to Mary, that Mary can save you. It doesn't say that, now, so, so let's say we have Mary is a door, the sacraments are a door, the baptism is a door, they're all doors. People, there's only one door, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not these things and Jesus, or it's not Jesus and these things. It's Christ of Christ alone. And that's why, as we read through the Bible, John, well, I love the Bible, period, but as you read through John, He's constantly, Jesus Christ, is constantly proclaiming to the world at that time, I am the great I am. The I am of what? Everything. Not just spirit, not just light, not just bread, not just the door. He is God. I can't comprehend all that. He is God of all. So you can say, I am, and put Christ's name in conjunction with it. He is God. A God of love, a God of mercy, a God of under- who wants to reach out. The, the Father sent His only begotten Son. Why? Because He loved you and me. But we have a great responsibility. You won't maybe understand this. Uh, I'm very glad we moved to Nashua. I've been in Litchfield. I've talked to my neighbors. They're not the friendliest people. Uh, they got Presbyterians from right. They haven't been to church once since I've been there. As right as I look out for my house. The guy on the other side, we talked quite a bit. The guy over there I talked to. There's a fireman down here, stuff like that. But as far as being open to the gospel, they have not been open. Now, part of that may be my problem. Maybe I didn't, wasn't concerned enough for it. Maybe I didn't, wasn't burdened enough for it. Maybe I didn't put their names up to God. Yeah, I mean, literally asking God to save their souls. I believe we all bear responsibility. And I'll know when I get to heaven how I did in some of these cases. I know the people around me, at least for two or three houses this way, and all there's one whole section, I know all of them, and I need to remember them every night. I'm not the pastor anymore. I'm not the principal anymore. Now, right after my 9 o'clock class, I go up to the teen room to pray, to be alone. Just this afternoon, I was thinking about how busy I've been at times. God has his way of molding and making you and purging me or purging you. That's one of the songs we sang just a little while ago. So that I or you can be the most effective Christian God would have to be. And many people didn't understand it at various times. I've talked to them. This is what the Lord wants done. This is what has to take place. 
It's of God. Let it be. Let it go, or whatever the case is. Purging is good. A very specific, exclusive door. He talks about, I'm going to skip down to a little ways here and come back to that section later. Over in verse, uh, I'll read verse 7 first. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Peace. Pasture. Everything you need in life. All these people are searching for something. Uh, I thought I wrote down something. Thief, a seducer, crafty, dishonest person who will do anything to steal the sheep. A robber. Barabbas was both called a robber and a murderer. A man who will use violence and murder. Cruel to destroy and devour. 1 Peter 5 8. Third, Christ the true shepherd. Going back to verses 2 and 3, so I'll read them again very quickly. He that entered in by the doors of the shepherd of the sheep. To, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. This morning in Dave's adult class, he brought up uh, Solomon. He says, I won't tell you the context, but he said, I could never remember a thousand names. Think about it. There's seven point, uh, seven and a half billion people on the earth right now. I believe God knows all their names. More importantly, he knows all of your names. He knows you because you're one of his children. I can't comprehend that. That how does he know all this? He's God. He is the I am. He's the, he's the, he's the, I am the light. I am the door. I am the bread. He is. He, Jesus, who is the door, knows your name. He knows all about you. Think about that. And he still loves you. He still loves me. Sometimes when I'm writing a message, I just get uh, whatever inside. When I think about, yeah, he loves me, and he still knows, he knows everything about me. The sheep. Not meaning a group of sheep, or herd of sheep, whatever you want to call them, but an individual. The sheep. You, the sheep. He knows you. We're all different. Now, if you had put 50 sheep in there, I'd have to look close to find the differences. But I don't even believe it's even physically talking that Jesus understands who you are, knows who you are. I think it's spiritually speaking that he knows you and he knows me and we hear his voice and we should be following him. He called us by his own. Uh, let me just read a couple verses out of Isaiah. Just stay in, in John for a moment. Is it really hot in here tonight? Okay. In Isaiah 43, 1, the word of God says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. He knows you. He's the shepherd. You and I who know Christ our Savior are the sheep. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, it says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. He is the shepherd. I won't read or quote Psalm 43. He's the shepherd. He's your shepherd. He's my shepherd. He only wants the best for you. He wants you to grow in him. He calleth you by name. He, the door of the shepherd, guides the sheep to green pastures away from danger. He protects the sheep, John 10, 4. Gen, John 10, 4. He restores the sheep who have gone astray, 1 Peter 2, 5. He, the door, the shepherd, rewards the sheep for obedience and faithfulness, 1 Peter 5, 8. He, the door, the shepherd, will separate the sheep from the goats, Matthew 25. Boy, oh boy, this is a person, I mean, how many have had an animal that you really got attached to and the animal died? Probably a lot of us. The last one I ever had was the one that died summer before last. That dog was uh, been abused and everything else. It took me six months to reach her spirit. And I, you can find me strange. I don't care. I prayed for patience with the dog that no matter how she treated me, she wouldn't come near me. I said, I'm going to reach this dog. And... 
One day, I'm sitting in the chair, she jumped in my lap. And I knew the battle was over. How much do those out there mean to you? You've got to reach the spirits many times. You've got to try to understand where they're coming from. You've got to try to get down where they're at. It's hard. Uh, rescue missions and a place like that. Those people are coming from a, a different book, different life, different experiences. Unless you can under, attempt to understand where they're at, you're not going to be effective to witness to them. You've got to love on them. And one thing that I think the world needs is Christians loving on souls. He is the shepherd. His voice, sheep know the shepherd's voice, back in verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The shepherd's voice is clear, it's understandable, it's strong. He has, and the word of God has, the words of eternal life. Take all that Christ is saying, the bread of life, the light, I am the light of the world, uh, I am the door, that, that shepherd. Take what we learn from the word of God and use it like he was using it. To what? To reach souls for eternity's sake. Because they hear, they know the voice of the shepherd, they follow his voice. They follow him because they are the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100, verse 3. No confusion. Uh, God's not the author of confusion. There are Christians, and I believe they're Christians, that they've tuned out the Lord. Or they've desensitized themselves by allowing sin into life. And so even though the voice of God is still going to... Is, still going loud and clear, they don't hear anything at times. Why? Because it's turned them off. They don't want to hear. They want to keep on living their life for whatever reason. They follow the voice of the shepherd because they're talking back to sheep. They follow Joseph's shepherd because they are sheep in the midst of wolves. There are wolves all out there. They want to stop people. I got a couple phone calls tonight that really, would, I believe it was Somebody, something was trying to distract me from just, I, I did this sermon about a month ago when I, was, I put it together. And yet, an individual was distracting me. I believe that Satan uses individuals to distract Christians, for, to take them away from, so they can't hear the voice of the Lord. They We're supposed to follow him because he assures us and delivers us from fear. We've had Christians in this church who are fearful of death. I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. People, we're all going to die. And for the Christian, there should not be fear of death. I visited a certain person many times who was afraid of this, afraid of that. He's no longer with us. He did die, as we all will die. But why should a Christian fear if you know the shepherd? And he knows, and you know where you're going, and he puts the peace of God in your heart, that assurance of who you are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> he reiterates in verses 7, again, 7 through 10, what did he say in verse 1? Verily, verily, I say unto you. Well, why is Jesus stuttering? Is he stuttering in verse 7? He says what in verse 7? Verily, verily, I say unto you, I'm the door of the sheep. Why? Because if you go back, what happened? This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't get it. He's given them an earthly understanding, and they knew all about sheep. They knew all this. Remember, this is an agricultural country, that, that, especially almost every place around the world. They had sheep folds. They had shepherds. They knew all those things, but they could not understand what in the world is he talking? What's he trying to set, tell us? He's trying to tell you that just as the, the shepherd watches over the sheep, I am the shepherd, capital S-H-E, all the way through. I am God. I will meet your needs. I'll be there for you. Follow me as I speak to you. I'm the door, referring to the sheepfold again. Why? He knew they, they didn't understand him. When we were in Jordan a few months ago, I uh, went to a place called Wadi Rum. I've been there three or four times now. And I spent time, we spent time with the Bedouins. And uh, great lessons I learned from them about many things that are biblical, that Christ talked about. One was a sheepfold. Now, the, in the desert, there are still rock outcroppings. Uh, you'll be in a desert, all sand for miles, and all of a sudden you'll see 
There's rocks coming up, I mean, literally three or four or 500 feet above the sand. They have natural, what they use is natural sheep, sheep folds. They'll go into a place, uh, how can I do this? <laughs> this? They say these are rocks and these are rocks, and they're three or 400 feet on both sides, and then the rocks come together. But they'll bring the sheep in, way into the inner parts like here, then they'll make a campfire, get the sheep quieted down, and they'll lay down right there on the sand. We slept, I slept in the sand one night in the desert. Uh, I asked, what can we do different? He said, would you like to sleep out in the desert? I said, sure. Try something all the time. So all of us, even the women, all slept on mats in the sand. We had a couple of Bedouins with us to watch over us <laughs> that night. But what did they do that for? With those sheep. Now, they do have sheep. Matter of fact, Ahmad had sheep at his house. He's the main guy at this one section of the tribe that he's, he's from. They're Bedouins. Now, by the way, Bob, I'll, I have my Bedouin outfit. I can dress up and uh, help out in any way that way there. Uh, they're protecting the sheep. Sheep, by the way, sheep and camels are the livelihood of the Bedouins. In this village, they've got a camel track like a racetrack. It's about three miles long. It goes all over the place. It's just only in the month of November. I said, must be interesting. They raise camels for meat, for milk, and for racing. The ones for racing are the most expensive. Shepherd would lead the sheep into the ravine, calm them down for the night, build a fire near the entrance, and then lay down at the mouth of the ravine. The shepherds became the door, the protection. Sheep, Jesus was saying, he was, he was the door, the way, the truth, the life. He was the entrance to salvation, John 14, 6. Through Jesus, the door was the only way into God's presence. Through Jesus, the door, only way into God's acceptance. Through Jesus, the door was the only way to heaven. Everlasting, eternal life. What does 1 Timothy 2, 5 say? What, is that the first one? Well, but there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the only way. Pastor Small, uh, so this morning, you mentioned that man who didn't believe that Jesus ever claimed to be God. Wow. I wonder which liars and robbers, as it talks about here, who he's been listening to that have led him astray to say that Jesus doesn't believe or never said he was God. Well, maybe Mary was or Muhammad was or maybe they all were or whatever. They claim to be the, the door, but they're not. Jesus is the only door that leads salvation, Acts 4.12. Acts 50.11 says, but we believe that uh, we, uh, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. It doesn't say through the Lord Jesus Christ and lists all these other people or other things. Romans 5.9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Find pasture. The peace of God that passes all understanding only comes through Jesus, the door. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, 1 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 12, 1 Timothy 1, 5. Jesus Christ, the door, is the only door to the true pasture and to life eternal for all those who put their faith and trust in him. It's his pasture. He's the one that brings us satisfaction. In uh, Psalm 22, it says this, his pasture alone, well, it doesn't say that, I repeat it, his pasture alone can restore the soul. His pasture alone can give life and give it forever, John 6, 51. Jeremiah 3.15, his pastor alone can feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jesus Christ, the door, is the only door that leads to abundant life. What does it say over in verse 10? The thief cometh not, for, not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. There could be a period there, but there isn't. Because it doesn't stop there, because that's not it. That's not all of it. And that they might have it more abundantly. What kind of a Christian are you? <laughs> is your life, is it abundant life? Is it, is, it's like that, you know, is, is this half full or two-thirds full? or What kind of life do you have on earth? Did I sign up 50 years ago when, I, when Ruth and I said we did, and we got saved four or five years after that, that for better or for worse, absolutely, with no ifs, ands, or buts about it, And I can tell you this, the life that we've spent together has been blessed. It's been a great life. 
to see God work in Ruth's life and in my life as we were still young in the early 20s, to see us both come to Christ as our Savior, to see how God has watched over us day in and day out, to see how he's still watching over us day in and day out. She thought she texted me. There was no text on my machine on my phone. I looked and I thought I saw a text there. And so I ran into her. I didn't even look at it. And that we talked about later on, how did I know that something was wrong? Well, I thought I saw a text that she did not send one. She couldn't type. She was shaking too much. God woke me up. I love my Lord. You know what? He loves me. But he's not a respecter of persons. He loves you. That you might have life, energy, power, being in Christ. Life is opposite from perishing. Life delivers you from condemnation and death. Life is eternal. Life is satisfaction. Life is security and enjoyment. Once you enter in by the door, that's one thing Pastor Small is teaching uh, Children of Progress this year. They talk about people trying to climb over the wall some other way to get to heaven. And what happens to them? Once you enter by the door and have life, but not just life, but, but have abundant life. And I just want to just bring some thoughts. Christian, is your bucket full, three-fourths full, half full, near empty? <laughs> We're supposed to be lives. Should it matter what circumstance that my life is going through right now, whether I'm having abundant life? It shouldn't. Many times it does. The great I am Jesus doesn't do anything halfway. He doesn't want to just save your soul so you live out your life in misery down here on earth, or however you live out your life, he wants you to have abundant life down here and prepare you for life eternal with him in the presence of God. The great I am, Jesus. If you are not, not experiencing abundant life, it's not the shepherd's fault. I don't know what kind of life you're living. I don't know if you get discouraged, depressed. I'm not saying I never get down, I never this. I wasn't down the other night. I was exhausted. There's a difference. I was tired. But I was too scared to go to bed and lay down and leave her there. I got made her a sandwich. Uh, I had to make her eat it. She'd have it in her hand, and she'd fall asleep. I had to wake her up. Eat. You have to eat. Now, she wasn't ready to drink. I had some, some juice and stuff to drink, but she couldn't drink it laying down. So I took an hour to get her to eat that sandwich. Then it came up to about 40 or 50, something like that. Finally, around 60, she was able to sit up, and then she was able to drink some sugar, basically, and that was cranberry juice, something like that, but not diet. People, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Don't want to go through that. But you know what? My shepherd was right there with us. Why? Because he says, I'll never leave you to forsake you. That doesn't mean just in the, in the good times, I'm right there with you. You think he was with Andrea and Pastor Small last year? Absolutely. He never left them. His presence, his grace is sufficient. They got me going up to, I try to get out of it, have some tests done down here, but Christine wants me up in Lebanon to have some tests. We get along. But I tease her, and she teases me. She says, she said, because I've had a sarcoma type of cancer, that I'm prone to that now, so she wants to check me out up there. I said, okay, from now on, after this time, can I have it done here, send you the results? She said, we'll talk about it. They're gone the whole day. I don't like to be gone the whole day for a number of reasons. Church, school's here. Uh, Ruth's here. Uh, but that's what he wants. Jesus Christ is the great I am. He says, in teaching this one section, he wants you who know Christ your Savior to have abundant life, full of life, full of energy. What does it say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you. Some, last, some of the lessons that Pastor Small has been bringing Dave also, talking about talking to people. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. We've got to be led of the Christ to go, to do, to talk, not being fearful. I've got a couple books I'd like you to read. Uh, the first one by Steve Curry is even better than the, the second one's okay. But the first one just made me think, would I witness to this Muslim knowing that I'm probably not going to please him it's the last thing, the last thought he had. He has no thoughts of trying to please man. What did Peter say? Anybody? 
represent thought? What did Peter say represent? I'd rather please God rather than man. That should be your thought, my thought. We can't be fearful of being rejected. Gee, was Christ rejected time and time again? Were his apostles rejected? Absolutely. Yet they took the light of Christ. Yet they took the bread of Christ. Yet they took him being the shepherd. And explain that to people with the purpose and prayers that these people might have their eyes open from darkness to light, might have their, their hunger and thirst quenched, not by physical uh, food or drink, but by Christ. The, 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 that's why he says, eat of me. He's not talking about The Catholics take that as literally eating of him. Far from truth. Whose voice do you hear? Have you been listening to other voices that lead you not to green pastures or, or pastures of peace, but rather lead you to doubt, confusion, discouragement, to heartache, to disillusionment, then you're probably not listening to Jesus. And you might not even be saved if all of your endeavors are day after day. There's another whatever, and something else happens to you day after day. My dear friends, Christ is the great I am of all there is None other, there is no other door, there is no other bread, there is no other light, and there's no other, some other thing I won't mention right now. He is it all. Do you really believe that? I have to ask myself, do I really believe that? Is my belief here, or is it here? There is a difference. If it's here, then I'll take the glorious message that Christ gave to you and I and attempt, by God's grace, by God's strength, and my, my speech and my preaching would not be with it, Catching words of man's wisdom, of demonstration of the spirit and of power. And I'll take that to a lost and dying world of individuals. It was refreshing. It really was about a week ago. I was getting a haircut. The barber went after a person for Christ. I haven't been around that many people recently that they just uh, witnessed this person and talked to this person. It was real good. I've got to get that barber in church. I know that person knows Christ as her Savior. She got disillusioned years ago and uh, had them at church in years. I think she sent one of her kids on a bus over here a couple times 25, 30 years ago or something like that. 